welcome to this panel. We are talking about home, disrupting home, and we have got very amazing authors with us today, and I'd wish to let them introduce themselves. Um, I'll begin with Jennifer. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for turning up this evening, rather uh, afternoon. I hope we're going to have a good time together. Uh, my name is Jennifer Nansubukamakumbi, and I am Ugandan, um, but I do live in Britain. Um, I am an author. I specifically work with fiction, and I've published two novels. Uh, the first one was Chintu, and the second one is The First Woman. I've also published a collection of short stories called um, Manchester Happen. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's, it's a long time ago. Uh, and in Kenya, I've met readers who know my books better than I do, so I'm a little bit uncomfortable here. Um, so I'm happy to be back to Nairobi because in terms of literature, this is my second home because my career started here with Kwani, and I won't stop reminding you of that, and I am very grateful of that. Thank you. So, hello, good afternoon, salam alaikum. Uh, my name is Leila Bulaila. I grew up in uh, Sudan, I'm Sudanese, but then in my mid-twenties I moved to Scotland and I started to write there and um, I've written six novels and uh, my la latest novel, um, River Spirit, is about the Mahdist uh, rebellion in Sudan and this is my first time in Kenya, in Nairobi. I'm very happy to be here. It's much cooler than I imagined, of course. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Hemli, Hemli Boom. I'm from Cameroon, and I'm a French-speaking author that's what you can hear my accent and my English, but I have my interpreter here <laughs> if it's needed. And um, I've uh, written five books, and I have a sixth one that will uh, be finished soon. And uh, I'm here because my last book has been translated in English, uh, Days Come and Goes, Days Come and Go. And, um, and uh, it's my second stay in uh, your lovely country. I came first years ago, holidays, with my children, and I, I'm here again, and I hope I will be back soon. <laughs> ah, th thank you. Uh, and I'm impressed that you can speak English. I, I didn't think that. <laughs> yeah, but, um, so I'm interested to, to know more from you, because one thing that I saw cutting across many of your texts, for example, Chin to the River Spirit, and you know, th there's a lot of history that you tend to use in your writings, and sometimes it's a use of history that sidelines um, colonial time. I think this is very prominent in Chin to in the river spirit you also use um you use a lot of history in cameroon to situate you know the kind of conflicts and, and i'm interested in you saying more about why history is very important lately in texts that are coming from you know africa i mean if and i think well, uh -huh. Let me begin from Hemily. <laughs> you are the last, so you come faster. 
um, um, history, okay, how can I say it? I, je vais essayer en français. Je vais pas me I want complicated my life in trying to speak in English. Uh, L'histoire est, est, um, est importante dans la mesure où elle nourrit la fiction. Et elle, la grande histoire aussi, en tout cas dans mon pays, le Cameroun, n'est pas une histoire qui est connue. Elle n'est pas forcément racontée. On ne l'étudie pas à l'école. History is important when it nourishes the fiction. And history in my country, Cameroon, it is not really studied and analyzed. Et, um, uh, le, ce que j'avais moi envie de ce que j'ai envie de faire quand j'utilise l'histoire c'est de dire comment c'est moi c'est pas la grande histoire qui m'intéresse c'est plus comment elle va bouleverser les vies ordinaires history the reason why it interests me is not the big history it's the it's the history of how it uh, bouleverse or how it disturbs how it completely transforms the lives of uh, individuals. And, et, et, quand on, et quand on vit un moment historique, je pense qu'on n'en est pas forcément conscient. La personne qui vit le moment historique n'est pas forcément conscient. L'histoire s'écrit après. L'histoire va venir se construire au-delà d'un certain point. Mais ce qui est intéressant quand même, c'est à la fois ce qui se vit dans l'instant et les conséquences que ça va avoir dans les vies des gens. History is not written while it is happening. It, in the daily moment, you do not understand when you are in the historic moment. It is written after a course of time has, has passed. And what is interesting is how do you analyze history once that passage of time has happened? Et le roman permet de donner une humanité à l'histoire. Ce ne sont pas des grands personnages, c'est des gens ordinaires à qui on donne un nom, un visage, une histoire. Et tout d'un coup, ça devient réel. On peut s'approprier ce qui s'est passé. Au-delà de la grande histoire, on entre dans la vie et dans l'intimité des êtres. And the novel is a great means in order to recount these historical events because here you have characters who have had lives, who have names. So by, by personalizing the, these individuals, you can really see the history of that moment of time. So um, they say always that you have to learn from your failures. And before I started writing, I was um, a PhD student uh, getting a PhD in statistics. And <laughs> I failed. <laughs> and that's why I'm sitting here. Alhamdulillah. No complaints. But <laughs> while I, as I was failing, because you know it doesn't happen overnight, but as things were going downhill, I found a book called as, um, How to Get a PhD, and I read it. And the book taught me something. It said, said something very important. It said that you, to get the PhD, you have to study the, the, what has, in your field what was written before, and then you have to bring something new. You have to extend, you have to extend the, the, the knowledge. But anyway, this didn't do me any good, but I, I still didn't get the PhD. But then when I came into writing, I, this idea stayed with me, that I, uh, what I should do, because I don't want to fail again, is to <laughs> study the, what the past writers have done and then bring, do something new, you know? So, I believe, really, and this is for all African writers, I believe that history is, is, it gives us the opportunity to do something new, to write something new. Because, uh, because the African uh, historical novel is, 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 is the most, one of the most exciting um, you know, um, genres, if you want to call it genre, that is, that is taking place uh, now. And, and there's so many being really fantastic uh, his, uh, uh, historical novels, uh, you know, Segu, 
um, half of a yellow sun, chin to it's all it's all the, 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 for us as readers uh, delving into this African past that we don't know about or that has only been told through the colonial side is thrilling and is exciting. So I believe that that uh, you know that Africa African history is is a fertile ground for for the creative writer, and I think that more and more you know exciting uh, novels are gonna come out of that. Um, and probably uh, one of the things that I've noticed with the African historical novel is that a lot of the novels coming out at the moment are written by women. Um, and uh, uh, in Britain, people kept on asking me why are women, African women, writing so many uh, um, novels, uh, historical novels. But you you can see that all the history, at least the history I studied in Uganda, and the pre-colonial, I hate that, but the, the history before Europe arrived was always very masculine. And uh, especially for me in Buganda Kingdom, this is a kingdom that was formed and shaped by men. And then I started to write about um, um, the, that pre-colonial time. And I discovered a lot of women who had done great things, but they had been written out of history, or sometimes they were named in a particular way that implicated them in doing wrong because they insisted on being part of it. So for me, there was that sense of excavating that history and putting it out to say, hang on a minute, we we women contributed. And I think uh, whether consciously or unconsciously, women are looking at the history we have been taught in schools and are saying, okay, I'm gonna look for myself back into history because I know my grandmothers and um, the women before me must have contributed something to our world. But also, uh, as I got to study more history after high school. I found out that history is unreliable. You know, because as you said, history is not written as it happens. It is written afterwards. So it depends on memory. And memory is unreliable. People, if you notice, you can go home and talk to your sisters or brothers about things that happened in the family when you were young. And they say, no. It, it, it wasn't exactly like that. So uh, people remember history the way they saw it. But also um, people have intentions when they write history and they write it from that point of view. And other times people just lie, you know. So because history is unreliable, it is both very useful to, to writing fiction because then you dip into history and you can twist it the way you want and come out of history. After all, history is unreliable and go back into it. So it, it, it just flows into fiction um, quite seamlessly. So it's, it's very exciting, uh, or at least I find history very exciting. However, I am aware that whenever we write a historical novel, especially when we write history that has not been written about. There's a, a danger that people will come to our books and read them as if that is the truth. Because I found in Britain, people believe Shakespearean histories yeah. more than they believe the history. Because we breathe life back into the characters, into the plays, and people can see. So this is why you know we um, a lot of African women writers who are, coming in, uh, uh, into visibility, love to go back and excavate. Uh, I think that's quite interesting when you speak about um, women writers and moving into history. And I think um, there are various layers in terms of how people um, re revisit history. You can look at it in terms of gender, you know, in terms of politics, in terms of 
belonging and so forth. But um, what, what I would be interested to know more, because this is something that I found rather um, outstanding in most in the text that I read, for example, Days Come and Go, you know. You talk about, um, I don't want to call them tribes, but I want to call them communities, you know. You revisit our ideas of what a community is, the tensions that arise between communities within themselves and between other communities, right? For example, Bamileke in Days Come and Go By. You revisit um, Leila in The River Spirit. You talk about Anyuak and her Cholo background, you know, and she moves to, Khat to um, Khatum and her life over there. And then we talk about Chintu, you know, um, Kabale moving from outskirts of Baganda and living in, living in a Baganda household. And I find this a very interesting way of, you know, rethinking and representing our societies. And I would be interested to hear more on your comments on this because it's something that stands out very strongly, you know, in, in all your works. Um, uh, ce que je, je, je constate et ce que je crois, plus j'avance, c'est que il y a des sérieux doutes à avoir sur l'histoire qui a été racontée sur moi en tant que femme noire africaine. The more the thing that I believe in, the, the thing that I'm coming down to as an assumption, the more and more I advance in my work is that there are serious doubts on my history as a woman, a black woman from Africa. What have been told on me? what people said about me, uh, I, I know now that I can't trust it at all. Because I have the experience of being a Afri black African woman, and I don't only have my experience, I have other experience of other women around me, and I now know about the experience of women that came um, before and um, so for me it's important to think about it and to write my own experience of being me that's that's the the, the fact that's also why i'm writing and if i talk about community it's the same thing uh, when i hear what is said about our community, about my own personal That's the only thing I can talk about. It's the one I'm coming from, the country I'm coming from, and I know how it's work. And when I hear about what it said about this country, I just can say, I don't recognize this story. I'm not yet a, a small girl learning at school or a student trying to have a degree. Now I'm uh, uh, big enough to say, well, I have my own uh, regard on, that I put on it. And this story, it's not the good one. I don't know why, it's a sort of narrative. Et l'histoire est un narratif. C'est le choix d'un récit. Et les récits qui parlent de moi ne me disent pas. Ils racontent la personne qui a parlé. The history is a narrative, and the, the history, and it is a story, and the story recounts the story of me, not as I was, as I was constructed. It's not, I'm not even concerned on what is said about me. It's just the story of the person who is speaking is not mine. You have a big uh, writer in France called Céline, very well known and very controversial. And in one of his most famous uh, uh, book, which is called Voyage uh, au bout des ténèbres, he's talking about his arrival in Africa. He's, he's describing a forest 
un endroit très glauque et très sombre. Et c'est voyage au bout de l'enfer, ça se passe, ça s'appelle. It's a place that is uh, at the end of a... De, de, c'est, alors, uh, um, a writer called Céline, yeah. a French writer, talking about this experience in Africa, a big, a big one. And his, the, 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 the book is called Voyage au bout de l'enfer, a travel at the at end, the of, end the of the hell. hell. And the place he's describing, it's my village. <laughs> My parent, my grandparent lived there. When he's going to the hell, he was going in my village. <laughs> And this is so, yes, we, of course we have to tell our own story. Of course. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, had it even arranged my thoughts. Oh, Leila, yeah. Um, um, go on. Yeah, I mean, because I was, I was interested in some of the kind of violence that are attached to some of these, you know, communities and how the novels, you know, you portray, you overcome some of these, you know, sort of hostilities that exist between, you know, yeah. these communities. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, one of the things that I was interested in Um, because we've talked um, within the Anglophone literature, we've talked a lot about colonization and the violence. Um, but um, when I arrived in Britain, um, there was, um, uh, uh, especially within universities, there was uh, this post-colonial uh, moment where they were studying a lot of African literature and studying the, how terrible the world was, how terrible the West was to Africa. And I c- kept on realizing that um, they were not talking about Africa as it is. They were talking about themselves in Africa. And so they would go on about, oh, how terrible we are. Look at these wonderful people. Look what we did. Meanwhile, the, the first thing about things fall apart is when Ikemefuna gets killed. No university that I've been to would talk about that. They would just talk about how terrible they were. And I, so I quickly realized that put Europe in your book and your culture will be put in the peripheries in the West and they'll look at themselves and it's like you didn't even write your culture. So for me, this is why I put Europe aside, and I decided to look at ourselves and look at how ugly we can be um, to each other, but also how wonderful we can be, and all those things that we are. And so I focused, um, and, and I think this is my role, to look at my culture and look at the terrible, terrible things and put them out there in the world, exaggerated and say, ooh, look how what we are. So, for example, in Uganda, um, we believed that um, homosexuality was brought by white people. And uh, when history returned and said, no, 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 the, the uh, missionaries stopped homosexuality that was rampant in Uganda, we said, oh, <laughs> It must have been the Arabs because they, <laughs> because we just couldn't have done that. So uh, when Chintu came out, and there was a lot of discussion around it, but I remember one young man, probably in high school, that wrote to me an email and said, are you serious? You, th- you mean there was homosexuality before uh, Arabs came? I said, yeah. Oh, ter- he was so heartbroken, do you know? So uh, the <laughs> these, these are some of the things that, for me, are important. But also sometimes it is to, uh, because there's always this um, national amnesia. So when I wrote about uh, a woman who had had two, three sons, and because she wanted to remain in office, being the queen, the king mother, 
She used her son to kill each other so that she could remain in office. Then somebody suddenly remembered that actually she was queen, no, she was Kabaka of Buganda for two years and put it in the newspapers. And I kept on thinking, where were you? You know, of course he was angry with me for having miswritten this woman. Um, so there's also that role in terms of writing um, the violence and also the, the things that uh, were going wrong in our communities. But for me, the most important thing is to take our literature away from being reactionary mm -hmm. to the West. Mm -hmm. Because every time we write and say, look what they've done to us, they are there. You know, uh, and they will come 100 years from now. People will look at African literature and ask, so what, was, what else was going on apart from them being colonized and neo-colonialism and whatever? And, and this is what makes African literature very virginal because there's so much going on that we haven't touched. Yes, yes, absolutely. You want to go? Okay. Um, yes, I think you, you speak of um, national amnesia and, you know, using um, literature sometimes to probe some of these um, um, gaps that in our memory. You, you, know, you talked of memory being unreliable and sometimes we forget even collectively. So, um, and Lila, this reminds me of what you write in The River Spirit. I absolutely um, love that book. You know, moving back to the Mahdi period in, in Sudan and bringing out the complexities, you know, the violence that was there. And of course, you do this by writing um, across um, generations of people. So, um, wh why do you, th um, in your view, what would you think, um, how do we redress, you know, the national amnesia using literature? How do we move forward? How do we account for some of these, um, you know, incomplete um, memories, incomplete histories? Yeah, yeah. well, um Maybe to go back to, uh, to the earliest point, to earlier point, it's actually difficult for any writer to write without looking over their shoulder. This is something that you know not everybody can do, and even as if you're starting out as a writer, you have to be very careful not to do that. Most most people or most uh, people are wondering as they are writing, oh, what is my mother going to think? What is, <laughs> you know, what is my neighbor going to think? What are they going to think? They're going to think this is me. You know, they're going to think my father is a bad person. They're going to think. So a lot of these things actually cause this self-censorship, and it causes a lot of people not to be able to write. And a lot of people will stop writing because it's, it's, it, they, they cannot handle this. So one of the things that uh, you have to do as a writer is you have to really not look over your shoulder because this is part of the, 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 the role. Then comes then the bigger thing, as, as in the shoulder being, or the people looking over your shoulder is actually the 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 the, the, his, the narrative, the official <laughs> narrative, you know, and you also have to have the courage to to do that. Uh, so in 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 my case, for example, the this, the, Mah the Mahdi's rebellion is taught in schools in Sudan as being a wonderful thing that that the the country united against the the foreign in invader. The, the, the colonizer, and Sudan was successful, and it was, we ruled, we had self-rule for 14 years, and this is true, we had self-rule for 14 years in a, you know, in a kind of a whole Africa being, uh, you know, under the influence of all kinds of Europe, and there is this little island in the middle of self-rule. Uh, fine, but still, the, the, this movement was, uh, was based on, uh, a, 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 you know, a charismatic, person who claimed he was the Messiah and he, he was not. So now you, 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 you want to say, I want to have a conversation about whether this man was, was fake or not. They say to you, no, it's not important. It's not important whether he was fake or not. 
the important thing is that this was a successful revolution and this was a national movement and, and, and all of that stuff. But there were people at the time who, for them, this was very important, whether he was um, for, the, for the religious establishment. This was, a, this was a, the, the, a, 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 the most important thing, whether he was fake or whether he was uh, true, for example. So for me to go back, I want to give, as a kind of respect for this group, I want to reflect their uh, th way of thinking and represent them in, in the story because they are, they, they are, they've been marginalized by, by history as being suddenly this is not important. Um, um, and so that, that to me was, was one of the important things, um, you know, the, 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 the treatment of women and, and how uh, this revolution is like other revolutions. It starts off, uh, or a rebellion, it starts off with a sense of injustice, it starts off as a rebellion, but then after a while it becomes, it takes, goes down this line of, uh, um, you know, violence and insularity and it's, it started to become like we would recognize it now as ISIS. We would recognize it now as Boko Haram. So why are we celebrating it? Why is the Sudanese uh, ce celebrating it? That that then is is uh, is, the, is the issue. Yeah. You want to go? Can you uh, say the question again? No, I mean I, I was just interested in you know, um, but I guess you already answered what I was yeah yeah what I was thinking about. Uh, but I wanted to move to a different point, you know, because you mentioned about women suddenly gaining a lot of visibility um, in Africa, and this reminds in African literature and historical um, novels, for example. I mean, there are lots of, as compared to the times of things fall apart, you know, post-independence Africa. So there's a very, you know, visible presence of female um, or women writers in Africa. And you mentioned something very humorous for me in your text, Days Come and Go, about you know, women being expected to read literature you know, in high school as opposed to the men who are doing all this other technical stuff and everything. So is it that in, at a very basic level that men no longer write, or is it that women have just decided to own the space and, you know, run away with it? Or is it that... I mean, why is this, in your opinion, this rise of, um, women, of women Yeah, writing about home, writing about Africa? I think because we are speaking too much, we are women, <laughs> remember. <laughs> I, I, I don't know, I think um, what I can say in, uh, concerning African French literature is that during, uh, after the uh, um, neo-colonialism time, we had almost only uh, uh, men writing only. You didn't have women. It was a sort of uh, literature engaged and politic. And you have little women there. We don't even remember them. And maybe, but it's just, I'm, I'm just trying to, to an explanation. Maybe we arrive on a time where our stories are more complex and Nuanced. Maybe it's time for us to go deep inside what we are like people, not to convince somebody, but just to talk about us. It's not a, a sort of political struggle. Or maybe it is because what is intimate is also politic, I believe. But it's, it's more than that. It's just a way of speaking about intimacy. And if you go through that, you cannot write a novel saying all the women are uh, sweet mothers or, or prostitutes. You have to go through something uh, 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 really um, who resemble what we are today, what is our reality. You know, uh, in France, 
Every time you have a discussion about Africa with somebody loving Africa, he will tell you, oh, the problem with us is that we never forgot the colonialism time. We still think we are masters in Africa. And I just want to answer, I don't care. We don't care, we don't doubt of what you were. We don't, the question is not that for us, the question is, I've been resolved. And now when we talk, even when we talk about you and your relationship with us, we are in something deeper. We are in something different. And the, the way we look at you, it's, it's just a perfect contemporary modern way. It's the way we are today and we, the way we are today and where we stand each other. And it's different. And maybe I, I think it's, it's the reason why women uh, um, are, are so, uh, we have so many women in this type of literature because we, don't, we, don't, we are not afraid of this complexity. Um, would you wish to comment on that? Uh, I don't know, to be honest. Um, I think that it's, it, it's, it's, it's impossible to separate. I mean, you can't really change history. I mean, we can't. We can't. Uh, um, we 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 cannot be separate from Europe. We cannot be separate from the colonizer. Even now, the language that I'm speaking now, uh, it, it, it's become part of me. It's become part of my cultures. You know, I live in the UK. Um, so this this mixing, I I think that it's that it cannot be unmixed, it, it would be too painful, it would be almost like um, if I was taken to a space where there wasn't anything related to Britain, there was no the, la the English language, uh, you know, the culture that says, I would, I would suffer, I think. I, I think I, I, still need, I still need it now. So I've become something else. So it's like you've become, uh, we, are, we are now a, a, a product of this mix. You cannot, uh, uh, you know, um, we we cannot dream, we cannot uh, f um, fool ourselves into thinking that there can be a, a really a, a, a kind of a separation, a kind of a of a purity. I think that there will always be this 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 mixing. I think I don't think we can get away from that. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm going to push back okay. on my sister here. <laughs> um, the, the, the problem with, um, uh, with that, for me, is that, you know, if you've heard of Hegel, who, a philosopher who said that Africa didn't have a history yeah. before Europe arrived. And therefore, Africa can only be described in colonial terms. So whatever happened before Europe arrived was pre-colonial. Whatever happened after Europe arrived was colonial. And what happened after Europe left is post-colonial. So Africa is, it can't stand on its own. It's, it's scuff, like um, colonization is the scaffolding that allows <laughs> Africa to exist. And it is true, we can't separate um, the, the elements of us that have been brought to us from Europe. But there are a lot of elements of us that arrived from Arabia, you know, it's from the Arab world, you know? Nobody's complaining about that because this is the nature of culture. Culture, as Nguji said, is a river, yeah. okay? It flows, and nobody, nobody with common sense would talk about purity, because cultures have been colliding. And when they collide, uh, we take from the new culture what is relevant, what we think would be useful. And then we discard those of ourselves that we think it's become redundant. So um, we've dismissed most of the gods that didn't help us with colonization, 
And if the European God helped them uh, win us over, then we are going to take uh, that God from heaven and his Jesus and make him African. And this is what we've done with Christianity. And in future, Christianity is going to be African. You know, because that's what you do when uh, cultures clash. The, the West has almost dis d thrown away Christianity. And now you go to Manchester, I don't know in Aberdeen, but you find Africans on the streets of Britain screaming, come to Jesus, come to Jesus. I'm sure the corona, rather the missionaries, uh, uh, Livingstone, they are turning in their grades because, you know, Africans just own Christianity. It just, you haven't been to church, but all African manners of um, um, uh, praising have walked into church. They, their spirits, they get possessed and do all sorts of things. <laughs> Honestly, I swear. And then there's a band, because for us we used to have the, the, the drums, so that the piano was too boring. They've thrown that out, you know? And if you see what is happening in churches now, it's so African. But people like me, who are not Christian at all, are like, well done, <laughs> well done. Africa. So um, in a way, um, for me, I believe that had Europe arrived without colonization, probably would have taken on Christianity, probably would have taken on quite a few things, but they wouldn't define us the way Europe defines us now, okay? Because we have been doing that even before Europe arrived. Do I make sense? Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, that's a very interesting point you raise. I would have wished to go on about how you know Christianity has been Africanized. Uh, yeah, but I'm reminded that we need to also let in the audience into the conversation in the interest of time. So um, I'll switch back to the audience. So the light is too powerful, so I cannot see all the hands. There is a microphone over here. So yeah, okay, and there's there's a lady over there. You will allow them to, to, to just ask their questions, then we'll answer them together, right? Okay, yeah, we'll take some set of questions then. Um, hi. Um, so I've heard um, how we talk. Can I be heard? Yeah, um, I've heard how um, we can separate ourselves from Europe and um, the white voice, but as an African, whenever um, I try to write anything, um, I hear the, the white man or the influences of Europe and America, because obviously my generation has been greatly influenced by um, what the West is doing. So how do you come away from that and write um, authentically? Because in as much as my influence is white and European, I'm still African, and I want to represent myself and my people in the right manner, but I don't have the, the words, nor even the strength, because all I know is white influences. And even in um, African literature, I can still see um, a lot of white pandering. Not, not all, but in most books, I can still see um, there's a lot of white um, language and you can see a lot of influence from, and there's nothing wrong with that, but how do we remain authentic to our people and our stories without any direct influences? Um. Um, before they respond, I would request that you just give two more questions, then we'll, they'll respond after these three questions. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna address the question to all three of you and you can answer as you see fit. Um, writing countries, and in many of these countries that you do come from, there is um, incredible conflict in what is the notion of this country. For example, we know that Cameroon has a conflict and different ideas of what Cameroon is or should be. Uh, we know Sudan is in the throes of a very terrible conflict as well. 
And when you think about writing countries in the context of this, how do you guys see it? How do you guys see the present moment in your countries around this? And then to you, um, Jennifer, regarding um, the use of sexuality in politic in Uganda, um, how, do you, how, how does the history that you've been unraveling relate, or how do you play that out, or how do you share that in the communities that you come from, and how are people reacting to you? You, met, you, 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 you spoke to it a little bit, but I'd be interested to hear just a bit more. Okay, I think you can go on. We decided that Leila was Okay, <laughs> so I think that the, the question of authenticity is, is almost like an abstract question. It will never be, ans it will never be answered, or we can discuss it for, forever. Is this writing authentic? Is this book authentic? Is this story authentic? So for you, if you're starting to write the question, I think just write. You know, don't worry about it too much. It's, 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 it's just, it's, it's, it's going to stop you from writing if you, if you carry these um, you know, great concerns. It's better to, to, to write it and then see afterwards um, first how you think about it. Put it aside a month or two, then look at it and see how you think about it. You know, if you trust other readers, see how they think about it and, and whether anybody questions uh, the authenticity of, of it or whether people feel that, uh, you know, that uh, they recognize what you're writing about. So, because I think that these are very deep sort of philosophical uh, questions. Um, it, be it becomes a very kind of a deep philosophical question because you can never really be, I mean, what does authenticity mean anyway? And also p things are changing all the time. I mean, if I, uh, I've read the Nijuji and I come here and I say, oh, well, oh no, I went to Kenya, nothing like Nijuji's novels, but you know, it's it's, it's, it's because that was written at a certain time, and this is now a certain time, and, 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 and uh, you know, something in the countryside is not the same as the city, and even, um, you know, these, all these uh, famous writers, Jane Austen, she wrote about only a certain class, only like she herself said, five families. So uh, you don't really need to, to present, uh, you know, a, a kind of a grand thing that is very, uh, uh, you know, recognizable to everybody. You can just write about your own world, and that is your own uh, authenticity. So, um, je, je vais répondre en premier sur l'authenticité. Um, alors, moi, j'ai l'habitude de dire aux jeunes que j'ai en atelier d'écriture deux choses. La première, c'est que personne n'attend ton livre. Que tu écrives ou pas, Personne n'attend ton livre. So on the question of authenticity, what I say during the writing courses that I conduct, firstly, nobody is waiting for your book. Nobody. It seems cruel, but the fact is, nobody is asking you to be the, the future, I don't know, Toni Morrison. <laughs> and, it's, and it's a great freedom. You, you can feel free because you, are, you, you don't have a rendezvous with somebody. You see, that is the first thing. And the second is that talking about authenticity, all the voices you heard behind you, in your mind, in your heart, all these voices is your own voices, always. Even if you think that you have this West influence, is still your own voices. Even if you think it's your father's voice, it's your father inside you. All the voices are your voices. So don't hesitate. You have to use them all to write your novel because they all belong to you. And what you will write, nobody else in this world can write it, only you. I think there was a question on violence in Sudan and Cameroon from a gentleman over there. It was the Cameroon and Sudan 
Yes. And how you like today's world and the context of it. Um, I think when it comes to the, the the thing about writing about war and 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 all of that, I think for the fiction writer, our loyalty is to the people. You know, our loyalty is to the human beings on the ground. You know, we're not we we shouldn't be. Well, I don't. I shouldn't say we shouldn't be, but I I think as a writer, the loyalty is not to a cause. It's not to the power. It's not to the right and wrong. It's actually to the to the people on the ground. The people who who, the, who are forced to flee, the people who are forced to fight, the people, people who are forced to collaborate. The, you know, this is, who, this is who we write about, yeah. Um, en ce qui concerne le Cameroun, um, le Cameroun est sans arrêt traversé par des conflits. Sans arrêt, c'est notre histoire. That which concerns Cameroon is that Cameroon has gone through conflict without stop. It has gone through violence, seas endlessly. Et c'est toutes sortes de violences où elles sont claires ou, ou, ou alors elles sont larvées, silencieuses. Et en même temps, c'est un pays qui, qui tient par toutes sortes de choses, y compris notre histoire. And the violence that arrived in Cameroon was violence that arrived quietly, silently. But despite the violence, this is a country that has continued to hold on with all its history. Et même si je suis très touchée et très blessée par ce qui se passe dans ce pays, je suis sûre que ce n'est pas une question de... de Comment dire Ce n'est pas une question de se séparer définitivement. C'est une question de comprendre d'où vient la violence. And even if it has touched me and hurt me deeply, the question is not how do I separate from this violence, but to understand from where does this arrive. Uh, um, thank you for that. Uh, I think we can field two more questions and we'll be done because of time. Our authors are still around, so I believe we'll engage them even after this. Thank you. Um, my question is about concerning the idea of writing home and the use of local language, local context, local references in your writing, which mostly I'm mostly familiar with Ms. McCombie's writing and you know, it's my mother's first opportunity to read a Ugandan female protagonist and to see not just the language of her family, but the language of the girls from boarding school integrated into the work, which is a beautiful thing for her, but could also distance part of the audience. How do you, I guess, navigate the decision and how you utilize that language? Um, donc ma question c'est concernant euh, l'utilisation des langues natales. Uh, c'est quelque chose qui peut aider à intégrer le public dans le monde que vous avez créé, mais même aussi peut éloigner le public. Donc on, comment est-ce que vous pouvez décider, naviguer la décision d'utilisation des de langues natales, des références uh, locales et tout ça? Ah, now I'm the translating for you. <laughs> I have my revenge. <laughs> um, uh, about the language that I, um, language of, uh, my language in, in the novel. Um, one of the things you have to realize, I think Marachera said it very well, that uh, when you write, um, Maybe I should start with the fact that um, we always look at culture traveling through language. So culture, language is the train in which culture travels. So, and the novel is a cultural product. So when you use another language that is not yours, you know, you're already in trouble. How does that language then take along your culture? And of course, Achebe and Nguji, 
did that. But um, for me, um, it was important to realize one thing, that when I'm writing a novel, the characters in my book are not speaking English. No, they're speaking Luganda, and therefore I'm trans translating. So for me, the narrator can speak good, good English, but the, the characters, their dialogue, cannot be the same English as the Queen's English. Okay, so that's where I come to find a compromise between English and Luganda. Okay, but even then, English lets you down. It can be racist. It can be um, it can throw tantrums on the page. Uh, it can, so to say racist. So for example, in the first woman, there was a part where I wanted to write about a a black widow. These are Africans. How do you describe a woman as a black widow? It just, do you know what I mean? It just doesn't make sense that that language is wrong. So I had to leave that out because I wouldn't make sense to Africans why a terrible woman would be a black widow. But at other times, uh, there are certain instances and moments and also events that don't have an equivalent in English, okay? So this is the moment when I say, step aside English, my language is going to take its place in this book. This book belongs to Uganda, to Buganda, therefore to Luganda. Now, if you're going to find fault with me writing an Eng uh, my book, which is from Uganda, in English, and 99.9999% is in English, but you take fault with one or two words I've, I've put there from my language, well, you can put the book down and walk on, okay? <laughs> Thank you. But also, here's the thing. I need somebody in the US, or in Britain, or in somewhere in Europe, to remember that much as this book was written by a, a Ugandan in Britain, it was written specifically with the Ugandan reader in mind, with the African reader in mind. So don't get too comfortable, because this is how we used to read European in books, you know? They didn't explain anything, you know? They just threw words. You, sometimes you read a book written by a Mancunian person, and they use Mancunian language as if the whole of the world was colonized with the Mancunian language. Now I can identify it, but I didn't know before. They didn't explain, but we enjoyed the books anyway. So this is why I'm very comfortable putting my language in the book and say this book. It's like putting my thumbprint, my culture, um, on, on the book and say it's an international book, but it's Ugandan. So that's very important. Okay. I think we'll just move to one more question and then we'll be done. Yeah. Just one, the final sure. one. Hi, thank you to all three of you. So my question is also about the concept of writing home. Uh, and my question is just what conversation do you have with this concept of home, do you have a definition of home and does that definition shift depending on what you're writing or what you're thinking about? Should she pardon? Um, okay, um, you said you had just one more. Sorry. Yeah. Um. Um, the, the problem we are talking amongst ourselves because that was the question we dealt with yesterday. You know, so uh, I don't know whether you have anything new to add. Sorry. Uh, sorry about that. As, so if we could. Okay, then let's take one final. Okay, let's the mic, the other side. 
Um, so I'll make mine quick, so maybe you can take two. Um, my question is, um, what's the place of love in your work? So far I've read um, Jennifer's and uh, Leila's work, um, yours first woman, and yours I'm still reading elsewhere home. Um, and I can see there's a lot of love in the way you depict your characters and the relationships they have with those who are close to them. Um, could you just please repeat it again? Um, what's the place of love in your work, in, in your writing? And it's for all of you or whoever is able to answer. Anyone want to comment about love? Other place. <laughs> I, um, oh, I, I, I can't think about writing about people and writing about their intimacy and their psychology and the way they interact in their life and with life without talking about love and without talking about uh, the way they, 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 they construct their relationship. So um, uh, affection and emotion are really have a, a really great um, place in my in my work. You know, my, my, my first book was called Le Clan des Femmes. Um, I don't know how to translate it. The Clan of Women? Le, the Clan of Women. And it was about women uh, in um, um, uh, début du 19e in a, in, a, in a Cameroonian village, and I, 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 was deep, I, I, I was deeply inspired of my grandmother's story. In the beginning of 19th century. Yes, and uh, when people read this book, and they told me, oh, we didn't even know that the grandparent was loving each other. And I say, you are right, you invited love, you invited desire, you invited everything. People before us never love nobody. <laughs> you are right about it. And, and that uh, shows you how you have to go for uh, something as simple or la as a um, uh, sentiment amoureux, uh, love. Um, a love sentiment, a love yes, emotion. Yes, you have even that have been told us by white people. Even that, we, we have to wait somebody to tell us how to, how to love. And the, that's why I was saying uh, um, intimacy is also politic. That's the way we, we construct our, is our stories, even in our own house, is politic. When I look on of my f own family, my mother and my father, my father used to talk outside every time. So he was the boss. Everybody knows he was the boss. But in the house, we knew who was the boss, and it wasn't him. <laughs> it wasn't. And, and all these, these things are also things I, I need to, to, to tell in my novels. Um, I had a grandma who was, you will know everything about my life when I finish here. <laughs> I, I, my, my grandmother was a sort of very respected woman. And one day, I was uh, on the phone with my husband and we was arguing. And I was speaking louder and louder because I was angry. And uh, when I finished speaking, my grandmother asked me, who, who are you talking about? I said, yes, but I was speaking to my husband. He did this, this, he did this, this, and I was not happy. She said to me, is he beating you? I said, no, no, I don't talk about beating me. But how? He doesn't give you money. I said, no, it's not about money. She said, so is it is about your children? No. I said, but she said, why are you screaming? Why are you screaming so loud? And she says something. She says, do you want to command or do you want everybody to, to believe you are commanding? And in my head, I say, I want to command. I, I want everybody to know it. It's the difference between 
my mother and I. But it's the same old story about love and affection and emotion. And we didn't invite invented anything. It's just the old human being story. Um, I think we've come to the end, unless if you have any other final word you'd wish to say about home or something. If there is none, then I think come to the end. Um, probably I could talk about love in my book, The Way. Um, I, I grew up reading Mills and Boone, Halloween romance, uh, all of the works. But I, I was always aware that I hadn't seen that kind of love in Uganda. I don't know about the rest of Africa, <laughs> but I hadn't. And, uh, but I was aware of the way my grandmother and my grandfather loved me. And I hadn't seen it in the books. But I was also aware of how boys and girls fell in love, you know, all around me. And, and, and you're absolutely right. Um, that for some time we were told we, 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 we were told how to be in love, how. So these days you even find young men in Africa going on their knees, and that, that moment, you know, that is the civilized way of falling in love. But here's the thing, when I was writing The First Woman, uh, I was aware that in Europe, the word love is thrown around, I love you, I love you, I love you. In the morning, I love you. In the evening, I love you. Um, but uh, having grown up in Uganda, I knew that that tongue can lie. You know, somebody can tell you I love you, I love you, I love you, and not love you at all. And, and, but I was aware that there were times when I would feel that love without a word without a single word. It's just the energy from this boy to this girl. And that is the way I wrote Seal and Chilabo. You just felt the energy, the attraction, and that you cannot doubt because it's physical. It's the same with the love between grand, uh, grandchild and grandparents. They never said, oh, we love you, or you're wonderful. Even when they picked up a, a, a stick and whacked her, she was aware that she was loved. So for me, it was very, very important to put this kind of love side by side the love I had read in Western books. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um. I want to thank you for being here, gracing our Macondo Literary Festival. It's so nice having you in this panel and you know, talking about home and different ways of looking, revisiting home, Africa, and everything. So I believe we've come to the end. Thank you so much. Can you